splitting the Ross Ice Shelf in half. Now, th coming back last night, you may have noticed that massive tabular iceberg that was out there. It was a beauty. And it was unusual to see tabular icebergs that far north and that far out into the Drake Passage. I suspect that that came from this unit down in here, either the Pine, uh, the Pine uh, Glacier itself or the Thwaites Glacier, which is collapsing very, very quickly. Uh, the, air, the wind flow has been up in this direction and pu pushed it out you know, off the South Shetland Islands. That's the only way it could get there. So those big tabular icebergs are really, really distinctive. Uh, over in the Weddell Sea here, for example, uh, we would name that glacier as uh, came from that quadrant as, as A. The, the, there'd be A, in this instance, A63. That's the 63rd iceberg that has broken off from that quadrant that is of notable size. And then if that particular iceberg broke in half again, it would be A68, A, A68B, the larger being given the designation A. And, and as an indication of, of how significant that can be, uh, a couple of years ago, we were over in the uh, Weddell Sea and A68 broke off. It was 160 miles long and over 58 miles wide. That is a serious iceberg. And, and you drive up to it, you would float up to it and it just appeared the horizon, from horizon to horizon. And so uh, these things tend to ground themselves because there's only, there's at least another eight tenths of it below that, that level, and in which case it can ground itself and stay there for years. As long as these icebergs remain within the convergent zone, they can be tracked by satellites. So we know a lot about the currents of the Southern Ocean. We know how quickly they move. We know where they move, largely by tracking these, these uh, icebergs. And eventually they'll start to look something like this, and more of the ones that we see that they begin to dissipate and, and then uh, melt into the sea. And certainly once it goes north of the convergent zone, its time is very short. So that's just a few things about icebergs. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Right. So I, there's a little um, piece of paper up on the on the board on that side, and quite a few of you have put down a few things. But I'm sure you can be more creative, and let's get some things going. I mean, there are times when we get a long list of about 20 collective nouns for penguins. You've seen them up close. You've heard them. What about a pandemonium, pandemonium of penguins um, and, and a whole lot of other things? So be creative and add a whole lot more things onto the board and we'll put that on the trip log as well. It can be absolutely anything that you can think of. Um, Matt, what was your favorite one? An indecision. An indecision of penguins. <laughs> and that's a very good one. When you see them going up the, the highways, they see some of us, or they meet somebody coming the opposite direction and they can <laughs> and then they both turn around and go back to where they've come from. So that's a very good indecision of penguin. So any other bright ideas? Well think about it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Another favorite of mine is a stink of penguins, but it really depends on the day. So uh, the time is uh, quarter to seven now. When is it's at seven. Okay, so dinner is seven o'clock this evening. So you have 15 minutes to hang out, sit back, relax, enjoy each other's company, or go see Mr. Diego. I'm sure he's waiting for you there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. A kind of dome shelters made uh, with branches and shells and heated by fire. Sometimes they slept outside on the beach wearing no clothes at all, even in winter. They also use shells to make the flooring, which help to drain the water, keeping the shelter dry at all times. So they build their dwellings uh, over big piles of shells. They also build the walls with the shells and branches around the house for protection from the wood. So one of their main source of food was the shellfish. So they use the shells to make the flooring and walls around the hut, you know, for protection from the wind.
I took that photograph from my kayak that uh, was taken in April, that is autumn. As you can see, it's very similar to Antarctica. This is the, the west side of the Beagle Channel, very close to the Pacific Ocean. So you can imagine how the weather can be here in winter. It's uh, very similar to, to Antarctica. <coughs> they were sea nomads and they moved frequently, looking for better hunting possibilities. But they used to live in this area too. This is the Darwin Mountain Range. This photo was taken on the Northwest Passage of the Rio Channel, also very close to the Pacific Ocean. In fact, I found an archaeological site, a very important archaeological site, just in an island, just across the channel, with a big cave with piles of shells. Let, let me show you this. This is just in front. This is, was a big cave. You can see one of my friends at the entrance of the cave. I found uh, harpoons and tools inside the cave and this green grass over here actually are piles of shells, thousands and thousands of piles of shells covered by sand and dust, you know, that gain that, uh, that kind of uh, thing, you know, that, that, like a grass. Uh, actually they live the inside the cave or outside the cave depending on the weather and depending on the situation. This photo was taken in the southwest uh, passage of the Rio Channel. And I said there were a lot of uh, archaeological sites I found here. They were 600 meters above the sea level. They used these uh, trees for the dome because they are very flexible. And if you have time and you walk around in the forest of Tierra del Fuego, are very easy to recognize. Let me show you. The leaves uh, has two lobes in between the veins. I mean, am I explaining properly? Two lobes, two lobes in between the uh, veins. Very easy to recognize. Also, something that I enjoy very much is when we enter the bigger channel. I like to go on top of the, de the deck. And the prevailing wind here is the southwest wind, and it's a uh, very nice uh, uh, aroma uh, of the lengas, you know. We've been in, in Antarctica when there was no smells ex except the penguin colonies. But uh, it's, it's very nice, it's a very nice feeling to run that and, yeah, and get that smell. This is how the lengas look on the hills of the Rio Channel. I took <coughs> this, <coughs> this uh, photograph uh, in April, just before the snowfall. You can see the bigger channel at the end. Uh, this uh, is also a painting made by the anthropologist and Chapman. So the Yamanas used to travel in canoes in order to get food. And the canoes were used uh, not just for, for transportation, it was uh, an essential tool for hunting. And they used to carry the, the fire in the canoes as well. Believe me that start a fire in Tierra del Fuego, especially in winter, is extremely difficult. So they keep the fire burning at all times, even in the canoes. They were very skilled canoers and they used to travel long distance in their boats. Uh, if it's possible, they prefer to paddle that, uh, go that, than to walk. Uh, the kayakers in the lounge will recognize maybe this posture. This is a kid that, you know, the kids started to learn putting skills since they were very young. This is a turning stroke. They put in the boat on an edge and performing a sweep stroke. It's a turning stroke. Very technical posture. 
So the design and, that, and type of canoe construction was very peculiar. And at the first glance, it's uh, very easy to realize that it's completely different from any other uh, canoe. I mean, as it was, you were made from uh, with the bark and not from the log. No? That made uh, the canoe, maybe it's not elegant, but it was really good in the bad weather. They paddle very long distance and very seaworthy. And they carried all kind of weapons and tools for hunting on the boats. So the, the boats were made, as I said before, uh, with a bark, with an internal frame of Koiwe tree. Koiwe was another type of tree, uh, tree that I will show you now. So the kind they used was the Koiwe. Uh, the selection of the tree has to be, it was very, very important. It has to be cut in September or October because on that month it was easier to separate the bark from the log itself. So they had a special tool for that made of uh, seal ribs. Extremely difficult to to get there uh, in one piece, to get the bark in one in one piece. So the selection, as I said before, was very important. It has to be no less than five meters with no branches and big enough to make it uh, very stable. These were the paddles they used, they were very thin and designed, uh, designed to, to be less sensitive to, to the wind. And the kelp, because the kelp was their main hunting zone. Very thin. They used to hunt, to hunt on land using bows and arrows. They used to, land, uh, to hunt uh, birds using bows and arrows also slings with stones, and they used to throw stones with the, with the hands. They were very, very good about that, doing that. They usually carry a bag made of a stomach of the seals, carrying stones at the very particular um, size and weight that they use that for hunting. And they also use a trap for king crabs and fishes. But I would like to stop for a while in one of these harpoons. I mean, yes, they use harpoons for different hunting situations. Also, the canoe was uh, um, uh, an essential tool for hunting. But this one at the top was a very particular harpoon. I mean, the tip was connected to the handle. Um, but uh, also, it was, yeah was connected actually to the, to the middle of the handle with a rope made of seal tendon. And it was thrown, when the harpoon was thrown, and once inside the seal, the point disconnect from the handle, causing the, uh, the harpoon to get entangled with the kelp. Uh, like this. Next photograph, you will realize how, how the sovereign coast of the bigger channel looks like, so you will realize uh, how this harpoon worked. This is, uh, they used to eat different kind of berries. Maybe you heard about this one, the Calafate. Maybe you are traveling in the, after this trip or before this trip to Calafate to see the glacial Perito Moreno. Some of you, maybe, may, maybe you heard about that. But the city is named after this berry. There is a, uh, a legend about uh, this berry that if you try this berry, you will keep coming back to Patagonia. But the ice cream and jam doesn't count. Just, just to let you know. But yeah, they used to eat this. The name of this one is the Chaura, but the first name that they received that by Fitzroy was uh, a Devil's Apple. They thought it was poison, uh, but uh, it was not. It's very rich in vitamin C. It has the same consistency that an apple, but it's a little, let's say, bitter. That's nice. It grows on all the coasts of the other the bigger channel. 
This one is one of my favorites. It's a mushroom that grows uh, in all the forest of Tierra del Fuego. I mean, if you have the, the, the chance to, to go through the woods, to, to do a hike in Tierra del Fuego, and you find this, you can eat it, no problem with that. It's no, very easy to recognize. I mean, there's no other mushroom that could be dangerous. It's no dangerous, it's, uh, it's really good. It grows in the three species of Notophagus. We used it uh, at all times. I try to use it for cooking. It's not good for cooking, but you can take it and eat it, no problem, at all times. I used to uh, to guide five to six days uh, trips kayaking down the Vigo Channel, and this one of, one of uh, my clients' uh, favorite uh, dessert with dulce de leche on top is fantastic. So this mushroom is a sort of parasite for the tree. So as a natural reaction, the tree here covered the, the body with the guanaco skins. The next photographs was another human zoo. This photo was taken in Paris. We can easily recognize the yamaras in their typical squatting position. As I said before, they, they died shortly. You know? In 1991, some remainings were brought back to the Bigger Channel, to the south coast of the Bigger Channel, and were buried in a, summon, in a Yamana cemetery close to Port Williams, Nine Paris, I think, where they belong. So between 1860 and 1870, half of the Yamana population died due to diseases introduced by sailors, whalers, miners and seeders. From 1870, the numbers of deaths surpassed the numbers of birds. And it's estimated that the Yemen population, when Fitzroy first discovered the bigger channel, was about 3,500, that's an estimation. But, and by 1916, just 84 years later, there were less than 100. Also, maybe the lack of food probably caused the Yemen to be more susceptible to diseases as the seal they hunted were decimated by sealers. And yes, all that uh, was true, but uh, there was uh, another truth. You know, it's, uh, this is something that people don't like to talk about, is that there were killings, you know, many killings. Not just here in the Bigger Channel, it happened in the north uh, part of Tierra del Fuego and also in continental Patagonia. It's very sad, but even today, you know, people in most of the the books doesn't mention that. Even some books, important books, really good books, like uh, the Uttermost Place on Earth from uh, uh, Lucas Bridge, that it is known that they help a lot and they protect it, you know, but they never mention the killings. You know? So maybe the next story is not for everyone. Uh, I will show you some photographs that uh, you know every picture tells a story. And the next photograph will tell the story better than me. As I said before, uh, maybe the photographs are not uh, for everyone. Please make the decision about looking at them or not. But uh, this is something that happens in my country, and I would like you to know about about that. I mean, it's not the kind of uh, thing that you will hear in the tourist information office on most of the books. But uh, yes, I like, you, I like you to know this. This man was uh, Julius Popper, was a Romanian engineer and miner, and probably one of the most sinister characters in the Patagonian history. So he arrived to Tierra del Fuego in 1886 with a personal army of about uh, 40 soldiers looking for gold. He stayed just uh, five years. Leave my voice during this presentation, I promise. Um, so, it is a time that I feel like most of you guys have not been waiting for. It's the time to find out how you guys are going to disembark tomorrow. So this is why I've been hounding you all so much to get them flight details. And I apologize because I know how you guys are probably just as confused as me with Air Argentina just changing flights by the minute and the minute and the minute. So what I have here is the most up to date of what I have received from Rumbo Sir and the people on ground. So if you see flights that it's your time, that it's your flight number, but maybe the time's slightly different. For example, there's a 1415 flight that I know a lot of people were saying they're 1450, but 
but it's the same flight number, that's going to be the same thing, if that makes sense. So yeah, there'll be a few little confusions, but we will, we'll make it through together. It's just been a bit of a tricky one this time with all of the changes. So first things first, disembarkation. And this will also go for tonight if we do manage to clear customs in time and anyone wants to go out in town. You'll always be disembarking from deck free port side, which is the, tip, the way that you came at the start of the trip all the many moons ago. Feels like forever, right? Um, just make sure your ID card is ready. I know a lot of people pack it in their suitcases and then like, oh no, and you don't want to go deep in there. So just have them handy and then you can keep them as well as a souvenir. If you don't, just give it to one of us down on the bottom and we'll be able to recycle it for you. But if you want to keep it, it's, it's more than yours for the rest of your lives. Um, and then yeah, you'll identify your luggage on the pier. We don't need you to pick up your luggage and take it to the coach. All we need you to do is the stevedores who help us down there is you'll make eyes and you'll be like, this one, this mine, and just make sure you see it get in the coach. And then you can just hop on and take a seat. Um, they're all going to be identified by these different colours as well, but I'll go on to that in a moment. So, wake up is going to be at 6.45, and that is when breakfast is going to begin as well. It's going to be 6.45 till 7.45 tomorrow. Um, the first disembarkation will be at 8, and they will continue through to 8.30. Um, so just be aware of that. And we ask if you can just leave your luggage your main luggage, not hand luggage, your big cases outside of your door with that ribbon attached to it by 7.30 tomorrow morning. This way, myself and all of our other little worker bees can go by and get everything down on the gangway ready for you. And um, so yeah, just a reminder, hand luggage stays with you, cabin bag outside the door by 7.30. So this is kind of how it's starting to look. So we have four different buses tomorrow. You have bus one, bus two, bus three and bus four. So I'll go through each one individually so you know and it will click your brain there. So bus one is going directly to the airport and that's for an earlier flight. So WJ3460, that's at 10.08. And then the Argentinian 1863 at 10.15. Then the Argentinian 1349 at 11.15. So that one will be making a quick stop at the port parking area to drop off the other people on that coach with you, but then it will be going directly to the airport. So you don't have to worry about anything, just sit there and you'll get taken directly to the airport for your flights. That sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yellow ribbons, you will be sharing the same bus. You will both be on bus one at 8 a.m. Those are those of you who have later flights in the evening. So 1881 at 7.30, the FO5045, 20 past eight, or 25 past eight, and then AR1887 at 9.30. So this bus will take you to the port parking area first, where you'll have free time until 6 p.m. that evening, and then you'll just meet them back in the same place. Your luggage will stay on board, and it will be locked and guarded the entire time, so it is safe, you don't have to worry there. It's still always best, you know, you take your passports, any valuables with you, just to be safe, but it will be guarded and protected that whole time and taken care of. And then just at six o'clock, you will go and meet them. There is a little map just on the um, desk. I encourage you all just to take a photo on your phone. Um, otherwise, and there is gonna be one at the end of this slide, just to get you guys in the idea. But it's pretty much right by Hotel Albatross and the taxi round. It's right downtown. Cool, so that was bus one. Anyone on bus one? Oh. No, because it's only a short journey over. This has all been organised by Rumosa as well, our on the ground partners, and they are they know this place back to front. They run many many shuttles, so they've got very home. So, if you are at all concerned, feel free just tomorrow to just check with them and just be like any chance maybe. But they'll let you know, and if they do change their minds, they'll of course let you guys know when you're on the coach with them themselves. But good question. Um. Okay, so that's bus one at eight a.m pink and yellow. Moving on to bus two, green, and that's going to be departing at 8.10. Just two flights on there, but I think most of you are on these flights. So that AR1897, that pesky one that we can't seem to find that exact time, but it's 
seems to be going within about half an hour, so this is the time that Rumbo Sir has given me the latest. I know you all have some slightly different emails saying some saying 1450, but Argentina have just been changing flights left, right, and centre recently. So we're going with what Rumbo Sir has as their official times. And then AR1865, which is an hour later at 315. Again, your luggage is going to stay in the bus. It's going to drop you off at the port parking area again for free time. Again, everything will be safe and secure in the bus. And then you'll meet back there at 12 for your airport transfer to the airport, amazingly. <laughs> so, yeah, so you'll do that. That's nice and easy, yeah? You get a few hours of free time, stretch your legs. Cool. And then bus number three is going to be to the luggage storage and then later on to the airport. So people on bus three, which is AR1891 and 1893 at quarter past four and quarter past five, you guys will be being dropped off at the luggage storage, which is right by Hotel Albatross. And everything will be stored there safely for you. And then for those on the 1615, the AR1891, You'll be being picked up at 2 p.m., so please be back at 2 p.m., whereas the following flight at 17.15 is at 3 p.m. So this, you guys have a bit of a different line there, but you have an hour between. Does that make sense to everyone on them flights? Yeah. There's also slides by reception as well, like you can take photos, like all of these exact slides are back there, so you can take photos as well if you don't trust your brain. It's, I know it's been a bit of a sleepless night for a lot of us. I'm not surprised. Um, if it has been changed, the one eight, which one? The first one. It's been changed to what time? So we also have a two fifteen flight. <laughs> you may have just been moved to a totally different flight. A lot of people have had this where they've been moved from one flight time to a complete opposite flight time. It's a bit of a magic world out there right now. But there is a 1450 flight, so that's that one that I think was green. Green. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I know it is very confusing this time, but there's just been so many changes, and Rumbo Sir have been assuring me that this is, they're getting us on to these times, and getting us so you guys don't miss your flights. If you are concerned at all, my best advice would be either approaching myself, or approaching the team on the dock tomorrow, and the Rumbo Sir team when you're getting on the coaches and just seeing if you can go to the airport earlier if you are concerned. But these guys have been monitoring all of the flights out of Ushuaia for us and this is what they have been sending back to me is timing and flights. Um, so yeah, black ribbons for the later afternoon flights. Now, for those of you who are staying in Ushuaia, you get a little bit of an easier go of it. So white ribbons are those who have their own arrangements or ha are not staying at Hotel Albatross or Las Lengas. You guys will have white ribbons and you'll be dropped off again, the taxi rank port parking area where you can make your own arrangements to continue on. Um, so you will just be dropped off there. If you are staying at Hotel Albatross or Las Lengas, which I don't think there are too many of you, but there is a handful, we've got orange ribbons for the Albatross and blue ribbons for Las Langas. So this will stop at port parking area first, then the Albatross, then Las Langas. So you'll be in an order there, but you all will get dropped off. Um, we can only provide transfers to these two hotels. So I'm sorry, but if you are in another hotel, it'll be a case where you have to just get off at the taxi rank and get, make a taxi way there, because we're only able to get you to these two hotels. So for this one, you're going to be the last bus at 8.30, so that'll be bus 4. Cool. So. What time is the bus 3? Pardon? What time is the bus 3? It's bus, bus 3, that'll be at 8.20. No, uh, the white one, the So that's the bus 4, that's 8.30. Oh, yeah. that's the same. So people who are staying in Ushuaia are all <coughs> on the same bus. There we go. And this is that map that I was talking about that you can take a photo of at reception. Um, I can print them for you if you want. I'm just trying to reduce our paper paper usage. And so just if you can take a photo, instead of having a ton of recycling paper, that would be great. But I understand if not, I will happily print one. Just come see me if you need one. So as you can see there, you've got luggage storage right on Hotel Albatross. You've got the taxi rank pretty much on its toes as well.
Simple I've seen in the lounge in the last three days. Welcome back to the world of the living. Uh, you know, at this point in the voyage, I can safely ask everyone, who was hoping to experience a rough Drake? Don't be shy, but there was a few of you. Well, you got it. <laughs> you owe everyone else on the ship a drink. Uh, but yeah, it's that, uh, you know, it's an early start in the season for uh, many of us on board. This would be my fourth crossing of the Drake right now. And while on this voyage in particular, you did experience exceptional weather, uh, you did also get my worst Drake of the season. So yeah, yeah, woohoo, you survived it. And while I was forecasting you a, a meager three out of 10, we did successfully achieve a four out of 10. So yeah, good, good, powerful waves there, five meter swell, uh, really, really. Uh, a lot of motion around 2 a.m. in particular. Anyone feel the ship shuddering? Yeah, yeah. Shakes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the impact, the sheer force of the bow crashing into those waves, and it sends vibrations down the entire ship. It sounds like you're hitting solid objects, like, yes. you know, like crashing into mountains. Uh, but yeah, it's mountains of water that we're passing through. And it is not without the command and the experience of our captain to be able to navigate such waters. You know, I have uh, worked down here for many years and there was a time where we didn't have the forecasting or the ship to stay ahead of such storms. It wasn't until I worked more recently that I realized that it also takes a wealth of skill and experience in order to navigate the Drake Passage in a vessel such as this one. So with that in mind, I would love to call to the stage our very own Captain Gilles Cadere, who navigated the Drake safely for us once again. Very, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to see all of you tonight. <laughs> this morning at uh, Cape Horn, I was quite alone. <laughs> so, so it's good to, to see you. I hope, I hope you all enjoy your, your, uh, your voyage your, with us. The company have worked hard to have uh, citizen travelers for all over the world. And uh, for me, it's... Uh, quite an honor to serve on this ship. I love to 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 serve on a ship with uh, so many nationalities, so many people who come from uh, this beautiful planet. During this trip, we try our best to, to open the gate of this uh, fantastic and uh, quite unique uh, place in the world, this Antarctica. Now you will go home as uh, ambassador of Antarctica, and uh, I think you know better the the philosophy of our expedition team, the company, and uh, and the crew as well. So it's uh, it's a great great honor and pleasure to say to you uh, au revoir. I hope I hope to see you uh, all over the seven sea. We are always ready for uh, where you want to go. I, I can uh, follow you. Yeah, <laughs> it will be it will be a pleasure for me. So for this au revoir, I will. I will ask also, the, of course, uh, the hotel team will come and sing to say to say goodbye because uh, it was really uh, for us uh, a real privilege to to have you on board. But I, I will ask also three three gentlemen and one lady who, who will come on scene. You you don't know them very much. You, you have to understand that uh, we have seventy crew member on board, but some of them are working light night time and. Uh, you don't know them very well. So the first gentleman who will come on, on scene with me is uh, the, the bosom. He's in charge of the deck, uh, deck team. He's preparing the Zodiac. He's uh, in charge of the maintenance of the ship. It's quite uh, difficult, as you know, that uh, here in this, uh, in this area, we cannot have uh, many deliveries. So we have to, to deal with uh, with a small amount of uh, sure. items. Chicken so Isaac Newton is from Philippines Chicken. and he, he, no, he Serra, not no. Newton, no. Huh? Isaac Serra. He's uh, our boson for three seasons already and he's in charge of, uh, of all the team. He's doing a fantastic job. Thank you, thank you for your pleasure. Thanks for 
C'est donc un peu mal, mais il se un film que c'est au revoir. Il est from Engine Department, il est working on 12 to 4 watch. There is Andy, Andy is from Engine, uh, the engine Fitter. He is working for the first season with us, but uh, he's doing a fantastic job. He's always, uh, I bought everything, I bought everything. So, uh, thank you, thank you, Andy, to, to be at home. And of course, uh, you never forget the hotel team, and uh, especially uh, this lady, Madame Ellicott, she is working with me for many years already. She was in Toulon to take care of the sick. We were only 10 at this time, and she was in charge of all hotel department. You can see her every day uh, work, uh, cleaning the, the launch, and they are, she is also in charge of the crew cabin, officer cabin. So please, uh, Madame Ellicott, if you come on scene to say au revoir to, to our guests also. It is an amazing pleasure. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 and of course, for us, if we are here, all the sellers, it's because of the team, so it's also a privilege to have uh, one gentleman uh, on scene from the expedition uh, team. His name is uh, Daniel, Danny. He's come from Argentina. He's, uh, he grew up in a... Uh, 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 yeah, we are uh, family and a special event today. It's a uh, dance day, so happy birthday. You are living in Australia since eight years, no? No, I'm not living No? You live... 18 years in Ushuaia, so uh, it's really a uh, okay, from Atlantic. So thank you. For uh, now, I will call also the. It's time for us to have a, a smaller toast, of course, to say goodbye. I will join the, the pilot. Bernardo is waiting for me because there are so many ships alongside that we will try to, to find the, the, the good uh, pier for us. So I will fight with the uh, authorities to be on board. Uh, I, I will be on. Uh, alongside probably 1830, 1900, uh, to be sure that uh, we will have all of us a quiet night alongside, you have the opportunity to go out, the clearance will be done very quickly with the authorities, so you will have the possibility to enjoy your time also in Ushuaia. So, thank you for your this excellent trip, and uh, santé, and au revoir, hope to see you uh, soon uh, on board, I hope you really enjoy this uh, special talk. Santé, cheers. Santé, salut. Bye bye. Thank you. Bon appétit. Ok, c'est bien. Cheers. Mm. Ah oui, pour le hôtel manager, parce que c'est important aux choses à ce all the team will be present for this uh, special event. So, hôtel manager Laurent will come on on scene with me to have a music because he really likes to come. Uh, He's a showman. Voilà. Come on scene, Laurent, come on scene. Il est très très bien placé. I will give you the microphone. I will have to, to, to interpret with the team. I will go on a bridge for the arrival and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Fontaine. Unfortunately, you still have to drive it alongside, so you'll be needed in the bridge. Thank you, Captain. Au revoir. So I hope you're still enjoying your cruise. Right? All yeah. oh, memories? Yeah. Not only by the pictures, also from the heart, right? Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm here not to talk again by myself, but I have to introduce my team, if you may like it. You do? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Before I call my team, I would like to thank Jonah, which I always forget to mention. <laughs> okay, I will call our first team. Please come on the stage, please. The Gali team.
join here with our galley team headed by our chef Tony. He, he is also a pioneer here, just like me, and he used to sail with the, if you know the NS Explorer before, he, he was the only survivor now from our team. <laughs> yeah, that was in 2007, right? 2007, okay. Now I would like to introduce the team. Ryan, one of the cooks. Arpaio, cook. Paul, senior gallery utility. Rocky, cook. Toby or Joseph are pastry and uh, baker. <laughs> Julius our Gali Utility. Carlito our Gali Utility. And Ricky our two chef. <laughs> nice. So if you have a little bit uh, interest on your other interest on your waistline, then you have to blame them, not us, okay? <laughs> not me, okay? But before they will go, I would like to share something for you, if you may. So, uh, Chef want to uh, actually share the food consumption on this cruise for the nine days. <laughs> so, uh, Chef said we consume 300 kilos of fish fillet and seafood, 400 kilos of meat, 150 kilos of fruits and vegetables, 200 kilos, 50 kilos of flour, 3,400 pieces of fresh eggs, 125 liters of milk, 100 liters of fresh cream, 75 kilos of jasmine rice, 30 kilos of assorted cheeses, and last but not least, 700 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> okay, I would like to get them here, but they should have to cook for your last meal. So thank you guys, thank you. Thank you, boss. Okay, the next uh, team, housekeeping team, please. <laughs> Okay, this is a lot in our head steward. Jojo, cabin stewardess on deck three, starboard side. Murphy, deck four. Alex, deck two. Deck two. Alvin, deck three, third side. And our only laundry man on board, Little. And of course, within our hotel utility. Next group, can I call on the, the dining team, please? How amazing they can handle the raptors with their right with their tray. Salute guys. So Randy is our head waiter. Louis Francis. Mike Jane and Gigi. Not so sure if you this uh, next team will need uh, some introduction. The bartender is
So I call them JJ Drum and J was. So on behalf of Jet Bankers, we thank you all for cruising with us and hope to see you maybe next time. Who knows? Before we go, we would like to sing a song for you, if it's that's okay. Thank you. gratitude uh, going around it's only natural that I would love to on behalf of our entire team extend our thanks to all of you as well for choosing to uh, travel with us one question that I often get is does it ever get old going to Antarctica passing through the Drake well maybe sometimes the Drake passage but uh, once we arrive in Antarctica does it ever get old and the answer to that question is no, uh, but it's not as simple as you may think. It's not just the beauty of the icebergs and the penguins and all the wildlife that calls this place home. It's the fact that for us, your guides, that we get to experience Antarctica for the first time with all of you. It's not uh, my first time seeing it then too, but it's my first time seeing any one of you experience that animal. It's my first time seeing those smiles out on deck as you see your first glacier covered mountain. Mm -hmm. And every group that we have on board uh, is different. You all have a, a different flavor coming from so many different parts of the world, yet all making that one singular decision to choose Antarctica to travel to. So you'll have that in common. And for me, what really resonated on this voyage was an incredible awe and respect for nature. Uh, and all of our landings, we really stress the importance of having as little impact on these beautiful places that we visit. And with this particular group, I never really felt worried once. So thank you all so much for that respect for nature. Give yourself a round of applause, please. You're an amazing group, and I would happily have you all back on board again, truly. Uh, now, the sitting and sliding part, we'll get to that, but uh, you are doing exceptionally well on land. And to, to provide such an experience, uh, I also have to thank the incredible team and their wealth of knowledge uh, that they provide. You know, the educational component of these voyages is so essential for your experience in Antarctica. It's one thing to look at it, it's another thing to understand it and therefore love it as well. So thank you all for putting up with my constant changes of plans and for always being so ready to share your passion and your knowledge of Antarctica. Thank you very much.
Now, with all that said, we're not done just yet. As we uh, steam through the Beagle here, we have a few more fun events for you planned. And at this time, I would love to call Ozzy up to the stage. Thank you, Matt. Um, there's been a heck of a lot of thanks going around this room, and deservedly so. But uh, one young man here that uh, I had the pleasure of working with him for, what, 12, 13 years? He came on board as uh, like a nine-year-old, something like that. Um, but this has been an absolutely incredible voyage. As Matt said, we've changed our, our locations, our positions, according to the to the weather, to the ice, and all the wind that we've had. and we've gone to some absolutely fabulous places um our first one for all of this uh, all of the ship that we got to uh chiri guano point that was our first one and that's thanks to matt so matt thanks it's been absolutely wonderful working with you coming down here again with you all the team but thank you Matt, for all your hard work it's been amazing thank you Again, as Matt, and I just want to reiterate it, thank you for all of you for taking care and loving this wilderness, the wildlife, as much as we do. Um, now, you, now you get it, right? Why we come back. Okay, um, so it's left for me. We've uh, had a little bit of fundraising on board, and uh, we'd like to thank all of you who have taken part in our G for Good in the, uh, for the raffle tickets. And uh, we have raised so far 1100 and $75. So thank all of you who have taken part in this. So we've got a few prizes here to give out uh, for the drawing of the raffle. And uh, who should we call up? Can we have someone that we trust with our, with our lives? With our lives. Oh, we do. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, these are for the raffle prizes, so willy nilly, and we've got for the first prize, we shall have a lovely pair of penguin socks that you can wear with you. With prize, we have Janine 309. Janine 309. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. A wonderful penguin tie, a wonderful penguin tie we have here, and this one will go to. This goes to J407. J407. Thank you. Thank you. Another pair of penguin socks. People are going to ask you where you got those from. Very well. Thank you. Okay, we have the rest of <laughs> Jenny, Jenny, 309. Oh, no. Again. Yeah. Well, that's one brief foot. There you go. You know what? There you go. One brief foot. You can do that one. Okay, we've got the penguin hat. Wonderful okay, penguin it? hat. Um, this one can go to, we have Thomas 326. Thomas 326. There you go, you have to have a photograph taken of that one, Thomas. You like it or not. Oh, look at this. This is gorgeous, this gorgeous whale. That's um, a cushion cover. And um, cushion whale, cushion cover. That goes to Caden 316. <laughs> Janine's very kind, it has re-entered the socks and this goes, uh, how many tickets did you buy Janine? Okay, this goes to Zaid 216, 216. Oh, look at this beautiful, beautiful rare penguins in love as we all are in love with penguins. We have Zaid, come on, come back again. You have another one there Zaid. An Antarctica notebook, write down all your notes that you made in Antarctica you could have forgotten about. So it's your chance, James 407. James 407. Another pair of penguin socks. Yes, they. <laughs> Zay, do you want another one for another foot? 
Zaid 216. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one goes to Sarah from 400. Sarah from 400. Thank you everyone. For oh, okay, we're going to do this one again. Absolutely, this has now gone through its third wash. So, um, okay. So this one goes to, this one goes to Don, 208. Don, 208. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Okay, so as, uh, as Storm was saying, we've got a few things. Thank you. A round of applause, please, for Keith. <laughs> okay, as Storm was saying, we've got a few items here that we would like to auction off. And again, all the funds raised will go to Planetera. 50% goes to the uh, ocean. Just look at this, how pretty is this absolutely amazing pendant that Sarah got from one of the artisans, I think, in Ushuaia, on the dock, come, as you're coming into the ship. It's absolutely beautiful, so precious. And it's not on here. Okay, it's in here somewhere. <laughs> ah, okay, it's lovely. But in a beautiful necklace here, Penguins, you can take that back. What be, oh, I've got Christmas coming. Get an idea for a Christmas gift. Oh, what about that? Someone's going to be really pleased. May I be bold as to ask for twenty dollars for this beautiful? Thank you. Twenty, thirty. Between you, one. Both you put your hands up at the same time. Thirty. Thirty. Thank you. Thirty. Thirty. Do I have forty dollars? Do I have forty dollars? Thank you. Forty. I uh, forgot to get someone a present in a shwag, didn't you? So $40, $40. Do I have 50 Do I have 50 Do I have $50? $40, $40, $40 going once. $40 going twice. And, oh, 50 Nicked in there. You just thought about a Christmas present. $50, $50 at this moment. 50 Do I have 60 Do I have $60? Thank you, 60 Sixty dollars, sixty dollars, looking for seventy. Sixty, sixty going once. Sixty going twice. Sixty going for and sold. There we go. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Now it is said. There are four people on this planet who know the recipe for Coca-Cola. It is locked in deep inside the mountains in Switzerland. You cannot get to the recipe. Even rarer than the Coca-Cola recipe is Chef Tony's mud cake recipe. Only Chef Tony knows the recipe and whoever takes this will be the second person on the earth to know the mud cake recipe. How many of you tried out the mud cake re the mud cake on board? Okay, there's a few of you here. Okay, okay. If you're going to be uh, bidding for this, if not those of you who didn't wish you had tried it. So we've got Tony's mud cake recipe here. So I think I read 16 to 18 people. Great for over Christmas dinner. Okay, so we'll start off with a mud cake recipe of twenty dollars. Do I have twenty? Thirty. Thirty dollars I have. Thirty. Do I have forty? Do I have forty? Thank you. Forty dollars. Forty dollars. Looking for fifty. Forty dollars. I have forty dollars going once. Forty dollars going twice. And forty dollars sold. Thank you so very much. Um, for this one, do I have someone who can model this for me? Oh, Danny, there we go. Here we have this beautiful, beautiful mint green penguin star. And just think, Danny is modeling this. Just think, look what you can do with this. Oh. Does it get better than that? And no, it's the staff only and not Danny. 
Just for like a second. Look at that. Oh. You wish you had this on when you were doing the polar plunge instead of that stupid towel that you got when you came back from the board, on board ship. So it actually opens up, I think, even bigger than this one, Ben. Even longer. Look. Yeah, you can have a longer cape. Where is it? Happens. Okay. All right. Oh, it's like a tube necklace. Ah, a necklace. Um, tube scarf. Okay, for the penguin scarf, let's start off with $30. Do I have $30? 30, thank you. 40, do I have 40? At the moment, I'm 30 midships. Do I have 40? <coughs> Excuse me. 40, 40 I have. 40 I have, thank you. Apple and the auction. Uh, you'll hear the bow thrusters rumbling here, but don't go anywhere yet. We just have one more thing to show you. So if I get the staff to close the blind. Yeah, if anyone wants to close blind as well, we're going to have a little presentation for you. If they want to. So our photographer Shereen here has compiled a beautiful collection of photos and they're in an order that highlight and tell the story of your voyage and this will be provided uh, in your trip log. So I hope you all enjoy and have a nice opportunity to reminisce on this amazing voyage that we've had together. Do you want to say anything? All right. Did everybody have a good time? Yeah. Woo! Congratulations on finishing this epic voyage. Um, I'm only one person, so I know everybody has also shared amazing photos with me, so I'm really glad everybody also got some incredible footage and seeing some amazing wildlife and also experiencing some new uh, places, even for myself. So it's always nice to look at something with fresh eyes. So these are just uh, a couple of my favorites, and uh, we have some music accompanied. Uh, by Jeff and uh, the Saint, so I hope you enjoy.
you, thank you, thank you so much, Shreen, for such a beautiful slideshow. And uh, excuse our <laughs> hilariously messy desktop here. We'll just take a moment to hide that from you. Okay, there we go. Whew, just like how I clean my room. So, well, everyone, you can hear the valve thrusters roaring right now. We are just pulling up alongside Inushwaya a little bit earlier than expected, which is nice. Uh, we still have to have authorities come on board uh, and search all our cabins for penguins. Uh, so it does take a little while still before we are cleared uh, to leave the vessel. So don't all go rushing down to uh, deck three in order to depart just yet because you will need to wait for an announcement to let you know uh, when you may leave the vessel. And do not forget to bring with you your passenger card if you do decide to do so. And do not forget that the best car in Ushuaia it, tonight is going to be onboard expedition as we all have one last celebration together for such a fantastic voyage. Thank you all very much. I dream about the days to come when I won't have to leave alone. About the time I won't have to see.
Just she's uh, we all love her to bits. Lynn, I'm gonna dedicate this to you because this is a song I wrote about a penguin. Okay, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> we all love penguins. We do. Yes. It's not here. I'll 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 think the words, it's okay. Okay. Stones, oh, so joyfully. Little Jackie Gentoo 
blow that rascal puff and brought him all those little stones and other stinky stuff. Oh, puff the gin to pay when little by the sea and sat there on his pile of stones, oh, so joyfully. Oh, puff the gin to pay when little by the sea and brother. sing their penguin songs then puff with friend lady and puff would go to he try not to stay too long well now i wait for jackie i'm hungry for a meal i hope that jackie's not been ripped up by a leopard seal oh, Sat there on his pile of stones, oh so joyfully. Oh, puff the gin to ping when little by the sea. And sat there on his pile of stones, oh so joyfully. Well, puff did not like skewers, they are really mean. And what they do to chicks and eggs is really quite obscene. They chase us and torment us, and from us they do eat. I keep on finding pals of mine, but just their heads and feet. Oh, a pigeon to pay when they by the sea, and sat there on his pile of stones, oh, so joyfully. From the sea and on the wing, I heard a giant petrel took down a mighty king. Well, humans don't consume us. Well, I heard there were a few, like the man that they call Shackleton and all his freaking crew. Oh, puff the tent to pay with little by the sea and set there.
times like this and learn to live again. In the times like this, time and time again. This is a little being young for you. Searching for a heart of gold, and I get no. Keeps me searching for a heart of gold, and I get no. Or somebody 